Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to today's episode of Inpatient Myeloma Radio, a show that connects top researchers with patients. This is our 32nd show and is an important tool for patients to learn about the very latest in myeloma research. So please share these interviews with your friends on your Facebook page or in discussion groups or on other social media. The more we as patients know, the better our outcomes will be. Now, if you'd like to receive a weekly email about past and upcoming interviews, you can subscribe to our Mpatient Minute newsletter on the homepage or follow us there on Facebook or Twitter. And we have a new site called MyLomaCrowd.org. That's the first comprehensive site for myeloma. We just created a new Facebook group called the Myeloma Family and Caregiver Group that's featured in a post on that site. So feel free to share that post on your timeline to your family so we can connect the entire myeloma community. Now, there has been terrific buzz as of late about the Mayo Clinic measles vaccine used successfully in a very early clinical trial. So we are very privileged today to have with us Dr. Stephen Russell of the Mayo Clinic, the primary investigator of that study, and the founder of this therapy approach. So Dr. Russell, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks very much for inviting me, Jenny. Well, let me introduce you, if you don't mind. Okay. Dr. Dr. Stephen Russell is a board-certified hematologist and world leader in the field of gene and virus therapy. He graduated from Edinburgh University Medical School in England, having decided as a medical undergraduate that he would spend his life attempting to convert viruses into powerful anti-cancer drugs. He received his early hematology training at the University College Hospital in London and his early lab research training at the Royal Marsden Hospital also in London. He obtained his PhD from the University of London in 1990 for his thesis on virus therapies and became a consultant hematologist at the Addenbrookes Hospital, at the same time establishing his own gene therapy research lab in the prestigious Cambridge Center for Protein Engineering. During this time, he was the principal investigator for one of the earliest European gene therapy clinical protocols and was the scientific founder of Cambridge Genetics, a biotech startup company. Dr. Russell moved from Cambridge to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester in 1998 to build and direct a new molecular medicine program focused on the development and clinical testing of new genetically-based therapeutics. He's a professor of medicine with the distinction of a named professorship, the Richard O. Jacobson Professorship in Molecular Medicine. He serves as an associate medical director for the Department of Development at the Mayo Clinic, associate director for translational research in the Cancer Center, and deputy director for Translation Center for Regenerative Medicine in the Mayo Clinic as well. He was one of the founding board members of the European Society of Gene Therapy and a member of the board of the American Society of Cell and Gene Therapy. He serves on the editorial boards of several scientific journals, including Human Gene Therapy, Gene Therapy, Cancer Gene Therapy, the Journal of Gene Medicine, and the Journal of Molecular Medicine. He is also the author or co-author of more than 275 peer-reviewed scientific publications. So your background is amazing. And maybe you can start by helping us understand um, when you were a medical undergraduate, how did you come to even determine why you wanted to study this? Okay. Well, (laughs) first of all, thanks for that long uh, introduction. Um, I I got into this at medical school, actually, because because of a personal um, tragedy, as it happened. I was... uh, I was in my third year at Edinburgh Medical School, and I had just sat my microbiology final exam, and I'd done pretty well. We had 150 people in the year, and I was one of the top four, so I was invited back for a distinction oral to see who would win the class medal, and that was going to be in a few days' time when I got a phone call to say that my sister, Miranda, who was 25 years old, had died in a house fire oh. and her husband and i obviously was was devastated by the news and 
to take my mind off it as I traveled home to the um, funeral, I just read virology books. I saturated myself in virology, and during that time, it occurred to me that viruses were the last untapped bioresource. We'd used everything else, you know, uh, animals, trees, um, all manner of plants, yeast for alcohol, bacteria for recombinant proteins and so on, but we hadn't used viruses for anything. And I, so it was during that time that I decided, okay, I'm, I'm just going to devote my life to this. I'll work on viruses and see whether they can be developed as an anti-cancer therapy. And it was sort of, it, it, you know, it occurred to me independently, but it's occurred to a lot of other people. And actually, you know, if you look back in history, it's really since the 1950s when viruses were first isolated that people have been using viruses in an attempt to impact cancer. So, you know, it wasn't, Although it was an original thought, it wasn't. I was, certainly wasn't the first person to think of it. So mm -hmm. that's how I got started. And um, and interestingly, I um, I missed out on quite a few jobs subsequently as a result of having that particular um, goal in life. I remember when I finished medical school, the first thing we had to do was secure what we called house jobs. They're like an internship. Um, uh, they're, they're, um, they're like the residency here in the U.S. And um, and you have to do two house jobs, one in medicine, one in surgery. And so I went, and they're six months each, and I went for my interviews, and I had a very strong CV, but I was not offered a job. And after about 12 interviews, my wife, Janie, said to me, um, can you... Um, just run through what happens in the interview because I don't understand why you're doing so badly. And I said to her, well, what happens is I go into the room and shake everybody's hand and I sit down and they ask me, so tell us what you want to do with your career, Dr. Russ. And I tell them I want to treat cancer with viruses and then they quickly wrap up the interview and <laughs> send me out. And she said, Steve, she said the first lesson that you need to learn about interviews is that you have to show some interest in the job that you've actually applied to do <laughs> and that was really priceless advice because after that I found that it was quite easy to get jobs when I applied for them so, <laughs> yeah okay. anyway that's how I got it's into all the viruses so. and, and it has made from what I understand, you started working in other areas besides myeloma before this recent clinical trial that has garnered so much attention. So do you want to back up for us and kind of take us through your progression of what you've discovered and how you've discovered it and then how you got to myeloma? Yeah. Um, well, I've always, I've always been um, interested in myeloma. So... You know, in the UK, my, in my early days, I worked at University College Hospital, which was a, um, a very busy um, hospital with a great deal of um, activity in hematologic malignancies. We were doing a lot of stem cell transplantation, particularly for acute myeloid leukemia there. And, um, and I just got interested in multiple myeloma while I was there. I mean, I, I thought that this was kind of the most interesting of the hematologic malignancies to work on. I then, because of the virus um, um, obsession, I moved from University College Hospital to the Marsden Hospital to their research labs where I found a lab where I could learn about how to engineer viruses. I mean, it was at a time back then in um, in the uh, late 1980s when there were very few places where you could actually go to learn this kind of engineering technology. And um, so I worked there and then moved from there to Cambridge um, where I could get back into my hematology clinical practice and at the same time develop my sort of lab activity. So it was this hybrid um, of lab science and clinical practice. And in Cambridge, I was fortunate to be given responsibility for the care of the myeloma patients. 
I sort of completed my clinical training there and became a consultant. And as a consultant in, in Cambridge, I was given responsibility for multiple myeloma. And, um, and so I, I could sort of bring these two um, different areas together much more effectively when I had clinical practice and lab um, research activities that connected with each other. But myeloma was very difficult to model and work on. Uh, and, you know, there are many other cancers for which the tools are really much, much easier and more convenient and accessible. I mean, you know, one of the things, you, you, you know, if you, if you don't know the research game, you probably don't have much of a feel for this, but you can grow cells in suspension um, so they're not sticking down to plastic and they just grow in solution. Or you can grow them adherent where they stick mm -hmm. to plastic. Myeloma cells, are they grow in suspension. And that makes them much more difficult to work with for testing um, viral infection in the laboratory and testing what virus does to the cells because you can see it all much more easily down the microscope with adherent cells. So that's one thing that pulls you away from multiple myeloma. Another thing is that when you take cancer cells and you implant them into mice to um, mimic the cancer that you want to treat, it's actually much easier to do that with other cancers other than myeloma just because of the um, the, the few models that are available. Things have got better actually over the years, but when I started it was really a problem to work on multiple myeloma. So everything pushed me in the direction of other cancers. And it was in Cambridge that I decided that measles virus would be a great um, starting point to work on, you know, mainly because if you look at all the infections that are out there and all the viruses that you could choose between to try and destroy cancer cells, you really want to have one that's going to be safe. You know, that's the absolute first um, consideration that we had because we were doing something that wasn't really being done many places at all. People immediately have the thought of, oh no, what could go wrong? I mean, you're you're allowed, you're working with a virus, you're trying to teach it how to destroy something, and um, and how is that going to be safe? I mean, could the virus change in such a way that it damages normal people and that it can spread from a patient to carers and so on? So with measles, um, the idea there was we 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 had a virus that could already damage blood cells. A natural measles infection really hurts the immune system quite badly because the virus infects immune cells and, and destroys them. So we thought, well, that's, that's a good starting point. The virus is, is already out there. It's, we already know what the worst it can do to people is, and it already knows how to infect and damage the cells that we're interested in. So what we have to do is we have to constrain it, and we have to make sure that that's all it can do. And if we're able to do that and able to get it to be effective as a therapy, then we won't be putting the population at risk because everybody's already immune to measles, and so it won't be able to spread from the patient to um, other people. And so we, it was really a big sort of safety to population question that drove us to choose this virus as the first one we would work with. Now, of course, that also gave us the big problem that if everybody's immune, then how are we going to actually use the virus as a treatment? And that's where the, um, the advantage um, of the immune suppression that occurs in multiple myeloma is that many multiple myeloma patients have very, very low amounts of antibody against measles virus, and so they're sort of ideal um, subjects to treat with the measles virus. So it's an advantage and a disadvantage because you could get measles easier because your immune system's depressed, but for your experiment, it was perfect. So yeah, as long as you keep, stay clear of wild-type measles, then mm -hmm. the loss of measles immunity is an advantage for this treatment, yeah. And 
can you explain the engineering process, what, what you are doing to make it an engineered measles virus? Yeah. So, um, so one of the one of the big concerns about um, using a virus as a therapy is that, in contrast to the drugs that are routinely used for um, the treatment of myeloma now, this is a drug that goes into the body and then amplifies. So the dose that you give of the virus increases because the virus grows in the body. It, you know, when this virus infects the myeloma cell, the myeloma cells produce large numbers of progeny viruses, which are um, essentially clones of the virus that went into the cell. And, um, and those progeny then go on to infect other cells. And that's how the virus spreads. So it's a self-amplifying therapy. And in order to use a self-amplifying therapy, we thought it would be very important to be able to see to what extent it was amplifying. And so we built this gene into the virus that allows us to see where it's got to in the body. It's, um, it's the gene that naturally is expressed in the thyroid gland because the thyroid needs to harvest iodine from the blood in order to make thyroxine, which is a hormone that cr controls your metabolism. And the thyroid gland has learned how to very efficiently extract iodine from the blood. There's not much iodine in our diet, and um, you know, so over the years it's been a very important thing that this gland has learned how to concentrate iodine. And we know that the, the, the way in which the thyroid gland extracts iodine from the blood is using a protein called NIS. And so we built the gene coding for that protein into a virus. So now anything that the virus infects can efficiently extract iodine from the blood. And if you want to image the thyroid gland, people have been doing this for about 70 years, you give radioactive iodine and then you put the patient in front of a scanner and you can see the, the thyroid gland lights up because that's where the iodine goes. And so we now um, are able to put the patient in front of a scanner and anything that lights up, uh, well, the thyroid lights up, but then also uh, wherever the virus has got to also lights up. So we can see using a non-invasive imaging test where this virus has actually got to in the body. So that was the, that was the change that we made to the virus to make it um, suitable as a cancer therapeutic that we could, um, we could carefully monitor as we used it for therapy. The, the, the making the virus safe piece is that the, the wild type measles virus, obviously we wouldn't want to use for this because it can cause measles. And so what we've taken is a weakened strain of measles that has been um, grown for many, many, many years in the lab on cancer cells and which has learned how to very efficiently infect uh, and um, replicate itself on cancer cells. And it just so happens that it does that really very well on myeloma cells. But in, in adapting to grow on the cancer cells, it's lost the ability to cause measles. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a vaccine strain attenuated measles virus that retains the ability to kill cancer cells. And so that was our starting material, and then we engineered it to include this gene which acts as a snitch and which allows us to see where the infection has got to in the body. And tell me the name of that gene again that you added. It's called NIS, N-I-S. Which, which actually, you know, is a bit counterintuitive. NIST means um, sodium iodide symporter. It's actually, the N is for natrium, which I think was the, um, uh, the Latin name for sodium. So it's the natrium iodide symporter. And it, as I said, it, it transports iodine into the thyroid gland. That's its natural function. 
Actually, one other in interesting aspect, and we haven't yet got there with this treatment, but one other interesting aspect of the NIST gene is that if you get thyroid cancer, the thyroid cancer quite often will continue um, like the normal thyroid to express the NIST gene and to concentrate radioactive iodine. So one of the treatments that is uh, routinely used for patients with metastatic thyroid cancer, that's thyroid cancer that is spread from the thyroid elsewhere in the body, is to give a very high dose of radioactive iodine sufficient to destroy the, um, the tumor cells that take up the iodine. And so that is something that we have shown in, in mice that if we give our virus to a m mouse with myeloma and then we give radioiodine, uh, we, the, the virus works better. And we call that radiovirotherapy. But, you know, obviously that's something that we haven't yet tested in the clinic, but we will do um, later once we've established the um, safety and activity of the virus that we've developed as a single agent. So I know some patients get worried about that radioactive iodine when they go to do that PET scan. So maybe, maybe there's a, a bonus. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, radioact if you target radioactivity to the right place, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's definitely the case that myeloma is responsive to radiation. Because you know that, I mean, a anyone mm -hmm. who's had a, um, you know, a skeletal lesion that needs to be controlled because it's causing pathological fracture or bone pain, local radiation is a really effective way of controlling that. And if you have a solitary plasma cytoma, then radiation therapy can be curative. Mm -hmm. So we know radiation is quite a good modality, but you, you, this is potentially a way where you would be able to um, target the sites of tumor growth with the radiation. So we, mm -hmm. we're excited to get there. It's going to take us some time, unfortunately. And you began with mouse models for this approach and then um, just completed the results for the clinical trial. So do you want to describe what you found in the mouse models and then how you decided to construct this trial? Yeah, well, the, the main mouse model that we used was um, a mouse model that was developed here at Mayo Clinic. Um, the... Um, there was a patient here at Mayo Clinic, well, actually, you know, this has been the case with many patients here at Mayo Clinic, but this was a patient who had a pleural effusion with myeloma cells in the pleural effusion. Um, the myeloma cells were um, grown in the um, tissue culture dish by Diane Jelinek um, here, and then Dr. Jelinek showed that the cell line that she'd created from this patient's myeloma cells could actually grow in a mouse if you put it under the skin as a tumor under the skin. And it could also, if you injected it into the bloodstream, give the mouse myeloma. It would home to the bone marrow and would grow there. Um, and so that was the model that we used because it was a human um, myeloma cell line that could efficiently grow in, in mice. And what we found was that if we um, gave increasing doses of our virus to the mice, not only could we then do the imaging study and see the virus infection in real time, but w we also got very good control of tumor um, growth and complete cure of, of some of the mice, provided we gave a high enough dose. And, and the other thing we learned from those studies was if we gave the um, mice anti-measles antibody before we gave the virus, it didn't work. So there were two things that came out of that. One was you needed a very high dose of this virus intravenously in order to destroy myeloma. And two, antibody was going to be a problem if it was there. And so really based on, on those studies, we went to FDA and they asked us to do a whole lot of um, other studies to prove safety 
to their satisfaction before we went ahead with the clinical testing. And they also asked us to um, demonstrate that, you know, we could reliably and reproducibly manufacture this virus. And there's a, you know, it, it's so different to manufacture a virus that you're going to give to people versus manufacturing a virus that you're going to give to mice. Mm. Um, you know, it has to be so much cleaner and so much more rigorously tested and, of course, you need a great deal more of it to treat people than you need to treat mice. But, you know, there's a huge set of FDA regulations um, called GMP, Good Manufacturing Practices, which you have to adhere to. And, they're, you know, they're a whole story in their own right. But, for example, um, you know, if, if you go to the FDA and you say, look, um, mouse number six in this group of mice number three uh, had a hemoglobin of 10 on day four after giving the virus, then FDA say to you, um, okay, prove it. Mm. We want to see the records to show that the mouse was actually given that dose of virus, that someone witnessed it being given it, that the person who gave that dose of virus was qualified to do so, um, that the blood taken from the animal was taken from that animal specifically, that it was tested on a machine that is known to be reliable. So where are the records on the machine to prove that it actually was um, calibrated appropriately? Where are the training records on the individual who did the testing on that machine to prove that that individual can actually do that? So you, you can get the sense from that that it's, a, it's yes. a very different approach to doing lab research to do these sort of FDA-mandated studies where everything has to be backed up by training and documentation and so on. So, um, so we did those tests, um, and we, you know, we, we, uh, we, pr we, we took all our data to FDA, and they said, okay, you can, um, you can start at a dose of one million um, virus particles per patient. And we said, but we, we need to get at least... Um, at least a billion to, you know, even hope to see a glimmer of anything. And they said, yeah, well, sorry, you're starting with a million. So mm -hmm. we, um, we started at a very low dose. And, you know, I think this is um, it's one of the um, difficult aspects of phase one clinical trials is that, you know, FDA does um, typically... Um, consider safety and safety only for a phase one trial. And they, you know, they're, they're absolutely fixated on the question of um, is this going to be completely safe? And so we, we, you know, we started that low dose, and it wasn't a very popular trial, A, because the dose was low, um, and B, because we knew that a low dose wasn't going to be particularly effective. And, and so, we, you know, we shared that information with our patients, obviously. Anyone considering the trial, we'd, we'd tell them what we had. The clinicians here weren't that keen on offering it to people, and um, especially if they were in need of something urgently. And... Um, and the uh, the patients we saw at the clinic weren't too keen on it, but we, you know, eventually we we got through the lower dose levels, and we got up to the um, the dose level that um, we finished up on was 10 to the 11, which is 100 billion um, infectious wow. particles per patient. So, um, way way higher than anyone had ever received before. And it was the second patient to receive that very high dose level who was the first patient actually at that dose level who had no anti-measles antibody, who had this remarkable um, response. So um, she, Stacey Erholtz, is um, a, f well, she's a 50-year-old lady now. She was 49 at the time. She'd had myeloma for about 10 years. Um, she had been treated with uh, stem cell transplant at the outset. Um, subsequently, when she relapsed, she'd received revlimid and dexamethasone for about two and a half years before she, um, she started relapsing through the revlimid and dexamethasone. 
And um, and she then went on to Cybor D therapy, Cytoxan, Bortezomib, and Dex. Uh, she had a good response to that, but then relapsed through that. So she was still taking the medication while her myeloma relapsed. And she then had a second um, high-dose malfolan autologous stem cell transplant in August of 2012. And, um, and she... She came back in May of 2013 with, there'd been a change in the nature of her myeloma actually, because originally the myeloma had been just diffusely infiltrating the bone marrow and she hadn't had lytic lesions. And she came back in May with a, um, a large tumor on her left forehead. Her children had called it Evan. Um, and it was growing pretty fast, and it had destroyed the underlying bone. And on the PET scan, she actually had five um, plasma cytomas. She had another one in her skull, one in her clavicle, one in her sternum, and one in the T11 vertebral body. And we we looked at the bone marrow, and the bone marrow was diffusely um, involved with myeloma. And her tumor marker is free light chain, uh, lambda free light chain. She, um, so the, the lambda free light chain was increasing. Um, and, um, and so she clearly needed therapy and she was um, resistant to, you know, all the standard class of drugs. So she elected to go on the measles therapy. And, um, she, when we started the infusion, I think it was on June the 5th, last year so we started the infusion and she got a headache a really bad headache within a few minutes of starting the infusion so we stopped it and said to her well you know what do you want to do and she said I want you to finish like keep it going <laughs> so we gave her some Benadryl yes. and um, well actually because one, one previous patient had had the same thing and had said no don't give me any more so mm. it was kind of brave of her to pers persevere because we didn't know you know what the potential dangers were of continuing and um anyway benadryl made the headache go away then she finished the infusion and um and she was fine so after the infusion she said it was a bit boring her mother was with her went across the road to get some food for her and when she came back this is now two hours after completing the of the infusion uh, Stacy was uh, shaking. She was having rigors. She was vomiting, and her temperature went up way high. It went up to uh, about 105. And you know, we used cooling blankets and things to bring it back down. She uh, stayed in hospital overnight, and the next day she had a recurrent fever again her temperature came down and then she had over the next few days actually she had a few recurrent fevers that spe settled spontaneously and um, she also got some inflammation on her arm where the virus had been infused into the vein um, and the other thing that happened to her was her platelet count fell quite precipitously and so did her lymphocyte count and they came back pretty quickly. But, you know, I, for, just for anyone who's wondering, you know, is this a totally mm -hmm. innocuous therapy, which I think has been, you know, mm -hmm. the, uh, some of the media um, outlets have been saying that. And I don't think it is totally innocuous. Um, but she, she sort of recovered completely from that. And she said by 36 hours she could um, feel that Evan was shrinking. Wow. And... Um, and over the next six weeks, you know, the free light chain level returned to normal. Uh, Evan disappeared. The bone marrow uh, cleared completely. And the, um, the PET CT scan, we sort of repeated um, on a regular basis. And that became negative at six months. So this was a, just a single dose of virus with nothing else, you know, no other anti-myeloma drugs, no maintenance therapy, no nothing. Stacy 
says that the toxicity is trivial in her mind. I think, you know, she um, she sometimes, you know, doesn't think about what it actually was. I think for the people who were with her, they say, no, Stacey, it wasn't trivial. But she says, yeah, it was. Compared to stem cell transplant and the other treatments mm-hmm. I've had, it was trivial. And she, she very much enjoyed her remission um, because there was there was no other drug therapy. She said she felt better during this remission than during any other that she's had. Um, but after um, nine months after we gave him the therapy, um, she noticed that this Evan was recurring. And um, we looked at her PET CT scan and um, and we looked at her bone marrow again and they were completely clear. So um, we just lo- gave local radiotherapy to that um, lesion on her forehead, and she um, she's continuing to feel very well. Um, so I spoke to her um, earlier today, actually. So she's she's feeling well, and um, and that's where we're at now with Stacy. The um, you know, Stacy's longing to find um, a companion who has as good a response as she's had. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the reason she's a historic patient is because she's the first patient ever, anywhere, with disseminated cancer to have a complete response after intravenous administration of a virus so you know there's a lot of a lot of history and a lot of work going on to use viruses as cancer therapy we've known for a long time that you know it can be effective in mice but nobody previously had demonstrated that this could happen in in a person with cancer and so you know that there's sort of been some I think Again, it, it, it's the way things get distorted in the media is um, is something you can't really control. But you know, people have been saying, "Well, this is a wonder cure," but it isn't. You know, that's not what it is. It's it's a step in that direction. And, and what we are very excited about is the possibility that this may herald in a new era of treatment where we can have a a drug that you give once that will ultimately be capable of curing myeloma. And, we, you know, we certainly have seen that happening in our mouse models. And, you know, what's happened with Stacy has been pretty uh, amazing. Um, but it does fall short of a single-shot cure, and she is the only patient, you know, so far to have had such a wonderful response. Well, it's, it is historic in nature, and so it's any step is a great step, and this is a, a huge step. So comparing Stacy to the other woman, was the effectiveness um, for Stacy versus the other patient more a matter of dosage that was given, or do you think it was the genetic nature of Stacy being – now, you said she was light chain only, right? Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think it was that. But I can't, I can't know the answer to that question. Um, mm-hmm. you, there were there were a number of differences between Stacy and the other patient that we reported in that paper. You know, wh- one of those differences was that the um, the second patient, so both both Stacy and the other patient we reported had no antibody. I mean, that that's why I think responses were seen in in those two patients. So that's the first important point. But why was the response only transient in the second patient? She had a different distribution of disease. So she had many very large plasmacytomas in her leg muscles particularly and in her um, abdomen and pelvis. And so, and by very big, I mean very big, you know, sort of 10 centimeters across. You could easily feel them. And um, and so, 
And she'd had a great deal of treatment before. You know, she'd had a bone marrow transplant. She'd had um, all manner of different drug combinations. She'd had the sort of VGT PACE regimen that was developed at Arkansas, you know, that sort of everything, and the kitchen sink. And um, she had uh, her most recent treatment had been carfilzomib, pomalidomide, and dexamethasone. And um, and so very, you know, highly treatment refractory disease. And um, she had a free light chain level, a cap free light chain level of 31, and had all these, um, you know, large palpable tumors. And about day eight, she came back, and we were very excited because um, at that time her a free light chain at level had fallen from 31 to 8. And the tumors were hurting, and she thought they were shrinking. But she said, you know, with all the previous therapies that she'd had that hadn't been effective, these tumors had not caused her any problem at all, but they were hurting. And so the light chain was falling, the tumors were hurting, she thought they were shrinking, and we did this radioiodine scan to see where is the virus. We had done the radioiodine scan the day before we gave the virus, and there was nothing being taken up by these tumors. And on day eight, they all lit up. Mm. And so we knew that the virus was growing in them. We knew that um, something was happening. And um, we were very excited. And then it you know, within the next three weeks, they stopped hurting. The free light chain levels started coming back up. And um, and the repeat radioiodine scans showed that the tumors became negative. So it was, uh, you know, it fell short of being sufficient to um, have a useful um, impact on the disease. But... What we learned from that study is that the virus really does target the sites of tumor growth um, in a patient with multiple myeloma because the imaging data was so clear. And the other thing that the imaging data showed us was that there was a different degree of virus uptake in the different tumors. So they didn't all light up to the same degree. And that was quite interesting. Um, and I think, you know, what that says to me is that if we could push the dose higher, um, we we might um, see a much better outcome. Because, you know, as I told you before, one of the lessons we learned from our mouse studies was that you have to get up to a high enough dose mm -hmm. in order to impact the cancer. So, you know, one thing about this, this second lady was the distribution of her disease. The other was the amount of disease that she had. Mm. You know, because the, the size of these tumors was much larger, there was quite a bit more myeloma in her body um, than there was with the, um, the first lady. And I have a question about that, because as we've talked to other researchers, they've mentioned that um, being hyperdiploidy may mean you have a slower growing type of myeloma, but it might do more bone damage. So, and I read somewhere that Stacy was hyperdiploid. So, um, when you think about the aggressiveness of the disease or the extent of the disease, disease and you're saying that um, there was more disease in the second patient, how does that how does that all relate? Does the hyperdiploid have anything to do with it? It might do. I'm uh, I'm not. Um so I think I, I think these genetic subtypes, they mean a great deal at the outset. Mm -hmm. But I think by the time somebody with hyperdiploid has gone through a couple of stem cell transplants, become resistant to all other therapies, I think you're dealing with a, a di you know, you can't say, oh, yeah, great prognosis disease now. We're 10 years mm -hmm. out and it's come back after all these therapies. So I think the, the prognostic um, sort of... Um, 
implications of the different genetic subtypes do change over time it just because you know relapsed myeloma has a worse prognosis than newly diagnosed myeloma mm-hmm. and um and so i i don't know and and again you, you know it it is an it is an important question you're asking and i think it's a good thought but we just won't know until we have a lot more information you know, I think the critical thing for us to do is to is to keep on working as hard as we can to learn as much as we can about you know where, when, and how this treatment works, and that's what we're planning now. We're planning a phase two clinical trial in which we will treat a, a large number of patients who have multiple myeloma resistant to all therapy who also do not have anti-measles antibody detectable in their blood. So those will be the sort of criteria that um, uh, that define the, the sort of eligibility for the trial. And we'll see, we'll see what happens. You know, I think it, um, it's very important that we determine how often is it going to be effective and that we look very carefully at each of the patients in whom it is or isn't effective and try and um, understand why. The bottleneck we have is the manufacturing. And, you know, unfortunately we can't even restart the clinical trial until September just because of the time it takes to do the manufacturing of this huge amount of virus. And at the moment, you know, we're manufacturing it in our academic lab here at Mayo Clinic. So it's it's not a huge virus production facility. And so um, that makes it difficult for us. Okay, so in this phase two trial, how many patients are you looking to include in the phase two trial? At least 20 patients the phase two and we we're probably going to have to stagger that because we the current manufacturing lot so just to you know again it comes back to the manufacturing Um, we in our Mayo facility we use these 75 liter wave um, uh, bags which can take so many cells and we grow the virus up in them and we harvest it and we clean it up and we get it tested and we pass through all the FDA sort of um, uh, regulatory um, guidelines that we have to. And um, and with a single 75 litre um, production run, which takes about six months, you know, from start to finish because all the media and materials that we use for it have to be custom ordered and um you know the environment in the facility has to be um sort of controlled and so on and so forth and then after we've made it we have to characterize it and do all the safety testing so that's why it takes rather a long time from start to finish a single run typically gives us enough virus for only five patients hmm. and how long does a run and take so and the 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 run from start to finish takes about six months, but we, we you know we can we can sort of stagger runs so that we you know we do one we start one now, but we start another one in a month and another one a month after that, so we can sort of keep it coming. But um, you know we envisage that in September we're going to have enough virus for eight to ten patients. And our next lot of virus will be available in December or January to treat the remaining patients on the phase two trial. So, and this now will we, be we obviously, only we obviously, uh-huh. uh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, this will be only at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, that facility. I would assume. Yeah. Yeah, it's only at the Mayo and Rochester. Now, we, obviously, we don't want to be constrained in this way. And so what we're doing is we're looking at there are what we call contract manufacturing um, organizations that, for a business, do virus manufacture. And they have the ability to take this scale 
um, much higher. And so they can do, you know, 1,000 or 2,000 liter production runs or even 10,000 liter production runs. And so we we are actually working, um, you know, as we speak with um, a contract manufacturing organization that is going to um, really sort of push up the scale and get us a, a much larger amount of virus for trials that we will be doing next year. Okay, and a few follow-up questions on it. How do you test for the lack of a antibody presence? What tests are you doing to determine that? Well, we do two tests. There's one sort of routine lab test that looks for immunoglobulin against measles virus. It's a, an ELISA enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, and they run that in the um, Mayo lab. I think you know, quite a few labs around the country run that. So that's one test. The other test that we do is much more specific to our virus. So we um, we take the serum from the patient and we mix it with our virus. And then we look at the infectivity of our virus. So we check whether the patient's serum can actually neutralize our virus. And if it can, then that's an exclusion um, at the moment. Now, what I should say, actually, on that question of, of antibody is that we obviously need a way to get around that antibody barrier because, you know, if we have an active agent but we can't get it to the target, then the question is, well, how do we do that? So we, in the, in the mouse models, what we've shown is that if we use cells as carriers of the virus. So what we do for that is we take cells, we put the virus on them to infect them, and then instead of giving the virus, we give the cells that are loaded with virus into the bloodstream. Then they can actually act as Trojan horses and carry the virus to the myeloma cells. Mm -hmm. And we've shown in our, in our mouse model that using cells as carriers gets us... Um, uh, back to efficacy even after we've given the animals anti measles antibody. Mm. So so we want to we want to move that approach forward as well. And that's something we're actively developing, the use of cells as carriers for virus so that people who do so that it then won't matter whether you have anti measles antibody or not. But you know, obviously, for the for initially, because we we just have the the naked virus as our therapy at the moment, we we want to focus on people who do not have antibody. Mm-hmm. And that would be a nice workaround. Yeah, yeah. So a couple sure. more. And I there are there are also other viruses that we're developing now for which um, the antibody barrier is much less of a concern. And so again, you know, down the road we um, we anticipate that we'll be looking at uh, testing other viruses for which antibody really is much less of a concern. And I read about that in the Mayo Clinic proceedings, and it talked about how other viruses like the parovirus, which is, I think, in the same families, the the um, measles, mumps, rubella type of family, was also con being considered. Which virus? The parovirus? Is it parovirus? Uh, I don't know. My, the, there's there's a lot of viruses in develop at the moment in development at the moment as therapy for cancer. So there's um, there's a herpes simplex virus that um, Amgen are probably very soon um, likely to get approval for as a treatment for malignant melanoma. And that actually is, I, I should just take a step back and explain something about viruses as a cancer therapy and how they work, just so mm -hmm. that you um, kind of get as an understanding of this. So a virus works in two ways against a cancer. The first way is that it infects and kills the cancer cells and you know the cancer cells make more progeny viruses and they spread to other cancer cells 
The second way the virus works is that after the cancer cells have been killed, the virus infection is eliminated by the immune system. And once it's been eliminated, the immune system is now in better position to destroy uninfected cancer cells. Mm. And so there are these two stages of virotherapy. We call the first one the oncolytic stage, when the virus is destroying the cancer. And the second phase we call the immunotherapeutic phase, where the um, immune system is mopping up residual cancer cells. So the Amgen virus really catalyzes on the second of those two. So what's done in this um, melanoma study is that patients who have melanoma that has spread over their skin, you know, to multiple places, Mm -hmm. they get the virus injected, and it's a herpes simplex virus. It came from somebody's cold sore, and it was adapted to make it safe. And it's injected directly into the melanoma skin lesion, into one of them. And what happens is that the virus doesn't spread to the other skin lesions, but the immune system is alerted to the presence of the cancer. And subsequent to destroying the virus-infected cells, it goes on to wipe out the other melanoma cells in skin. And, you know, this really looks pretty good. You know, a phase three study has recently been completed, and Amgen... Um, have the data from that study, and it looks quite promising. And I, there's, uh, there's anticipation at the moment that that virus may well be approved as a treatment for melanoma. So, so those are the, there you have the sort of two paradigms. You know, the, the paradigm that we've demonstrated here in, in um, multiple myeloma is the oncolytic paradigm where the virus is given systemically. But there Mm -hmm. may also be an immune-mediated mopping up, you know, after the virus has done its work on the cancer. This Amgen virus really just goes with the immunotherapeutic side. So those are the two extremes. Now, if you look at other viruses that are actively being pursued as cancer therapy, there's vaccinia, derived from the smallpox vaccine, um, is being used both as a, an intratumoral and as a um, intravenous therapy. And that's looking promising, although nobody's tried that in multiple myeloma. There are some adenoviruses, which are common cold viruses. Um, quite a few of those are being developed by different companies for different cancers, either given by intratumoral injection or intravenously. Um, there's a company in Canada that has a Rio virus, a virus that nobody really knows what it causes. It doesn't seem to cause disease. It's found in in the human population. About 50% of people have been exposed to Rio virus, and they're giving that virus intravenously. Um, They are actually testing that virus in patients with multiple myeloma, and that's an ongoing clinical trial at Ohio State. Um, so that's a, a sort of interesting one. And, um, and you know, then there are these other pipeline viruses. I mean, we have one here at Mayo called vesicular stomatitis virus that um, we're pretty keen to take forward and test as a, another myeloma virus. And um, we are... We, we have submitted an application to FDA, what, what we call a pre-IND application. So it's just to get FDA's input on what we need to do in order for them to be satisfied that we can start a clinical trial with that virus. But it works very well in the in the mouse models. And um, so I think there's going to be a great deal of activity in this area. You know, I think we really will see other viruses um, being tested, and hopefully we'll see benefit coming from them. Oh, there's no doubt about it. And this phase two trial is, I would imagine, since this is so early, that it's 
the, vi- the virus alone with no other therapies. So you can determine exactly what it's doing and not, not. I would assume that, yeah, but is that yeah, the case? Yeah, that, okay. that, that's precisely it. And actually it's interesting because I, when, when I first discussed it, you know we have an enormous group of um Yes. of myeloma doctors here at Mayo. So when I, and we meet every Friday morning and we sort of talk through this and that. And the first, um, the first discussion we had about the measles virus therapy after Stacy had had her response, we talked about the possibility that we might combine the virus with something else. And everybody said, no, mm-hmm. absolutely not. You have mm-hmm. to prove that the virus on its own can do something. Because many of the drugs that are being developed for myeloma at the moment are being combined, you know, with Revlimid or with Velcade or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it becomes difficult to discern, you know, what the impact of each agent is. And um, so, you know, the the view of the group here was don't cloud the issue. You know, first of all, before you look at combinations, find out whether you really do have single agent activity. So um, so that's what we're going to do. Well, this opens up a whole new host of options because you could use it. And I don't know, we have, I'm sure we have lots of questions. I have lots of emailed in questions if we don't have lots of live questions. So um, we're going to keep you over, if that's okay, on your time and open it up for caller questions. So if okay. you have a question, and and I have so many questions that I want to <laughs> I would like to ask, but I don't want to hog all your time. If you have questions for Dr. Russell, you can call 347-637-2631 and press 1 on your keypad. And sometimes we have some very shy callers, but we would encourage you to ask a question. You're an amazing resource. I'm going to start with an email question that I have by Lori. She says, Dr. Russell, I noticed in the next measles vaccine trial that starts in September and patients who have had an allogeneic stem cell transplant are not eligible. Is this just for trial purposes or do you anticipate the vaccine, if it becomes broadly available, will not be effective for myeloma patients who have previously undergone allo transplant? And she says that, you know, allo transplant is not a guaranteed cure, so we're wondering what the future holds in terms of immunotherapy. And she also asks, are there other patients in your current trials with high-risk cytogenetic markers like deletion 17 or 414? And if so, what are your thoughts on how those patients will respond to the vaccine? Okay, so the the, the allogeneic transplant question is um, the reason allo transplant is an exclusion criterion is because patients who've been through allo transplant are quite... um, severely immunosuppressed over and above their multiple myeloma, you know, often on immunosuppressive drugs to prevent graft versus host disease. And so FDA um, uh, were unhappy with us um, including allotransplant patients in this clinical trial. But, you know, assuming it's safe, and I think you know what we have learned from the phase one trial is that it does appear to be quite safe even in fairly severely immunosuppressed myeloma patients i see no reason why it wouldn't um, be um, also used in people who've been through an allo transplant Mm -hmm. so um, so i think that's that question Um, the other question was relating to different myeloma subtypes. And I think, you know, we sort of briefly touched on, on that question because you were asking mm-hmm. about hyperdiploid. Right, we did. And I, it's just too early to say. You know, we, we don't okay. have preclinical models that can tell us, and, you know, we'll find out in the fullness of time. Okay, and we, we have several caller questions. So we'll start with caller at um, phone number 812-0546. Go ahead with your question. Okay, caller at 812-0546. You are live. Hello? Okay, maybe we'll try caller at 983-6757. Good afternoon, Dr. Russell. Thank you so much for taking my call. 
thank you for this work. It's just so intriguing and so promising. I realize it's very, very early in the um, process. And I'm a smoldering multiple myeloma patient. So I'm, of course, always looking to see if such therapies that you are developing for multiple myeloma patients could someday translate into the smoldering population and try to use it when the disease burden is much lower um, and perhaps less resistant. Uh, and my second question is, is the Phase 2 trial uh, coming up in, in September open to existing Mayo Clinic patients only, or will it be expanded to anyone who gets referred to your facility? Okay, so the the first question on smoldering myeloma is, it's an interesting question actually. And, you know, from what I've um, been saying about the anti-measles antibody being something of a roadblock, my sense is that a higher there's a higher likelihood that you will not have anti-measles antibody if you've had myeloma for quite a long time and have had all the other therapy. So I think it's, you know, it's a great option at this point in time to try if you have myeloma that's failed all other therapy. Now, generally, what you see with new myeloma treatments is that they're used earlier and earlier in the, in the um, course of the disease. And it might be it might be that someday measles virus or the other anti myeloma therapies that we have available will be routinely used for smoldering myeloma. But for the time being, you know, all I can say is congratulations to you that it's smoldering and that it hasn't <laughs> become symptomatic. Thank you. And long yes. may that can long may that continue. Yes, I um, agree. Thank you so much for that wish. So the second um the second question is um, is something that um, we actually have under active discussion at the moment. I think that the um, the the trial is open to people from anywhere, um, not just to existing Mayo patients, and um, that is something that you know has. Um, only recently been discussed, um, and you know that's a preliminary conclusion of those discussions that I'm giving you. Um, mm -hmm. But you know the fact is that you know now it's the information is out there. There's a great deal of interest in it, and it would probably not be um, appropriate for us just to um, exclude people who are not currently um, Mayo Clinic patients. The the interest in the trial has been quite overwhelming, as you can imagine, based mm -hmm. on the media interest that there's been. And so we, we do, we're, we're committed to having a fair process, um, but we haven't finalized what that process is yet. All right. Thank you so very much. Well, hopefully, if um, you do reach your goal uh, to get around the existing antibody barrier, someday maybe it will be um, available to someone who's smoldering because it's yeah. um, certainly a uh, unique approach as opposed to um, trying to use the novel agents that are currently available in some of the smoldering trials. So I thank you. I thank you for um, what you're doing and what you hopefully will do down the road. Thank you very much. Okay, we have another caller at 371-3695. Go ahead with your question. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Russell. I'm really uh, impressed with your results, and I'm actually uh, actually uh, a myeloma patient and a hematologist at the same time. I'm about uh, nine years out um, and coming up against some of the uh, issues that you were uh, you were discussing. And my question to you is a really a really simple one, which is: Is there an age exclusion? Uh, for undertaking this kind of treatment, and um, uh, do you think that's generally true of other immune-mediated uh, treatments like PD-1 blockers and 
things like that. Do you need somebody younger in or, or vaccines? Uh, do you need somebody younger to um, uh, gain entry to those, or gain, or do you think that it would be equally as successful? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Well, I mean, right now there's absolutely no um, uh, age requirement for participation in a clinical trial. Um, you know, it's something that obviously we'll um, we'll look at um, as time goes by and as we treat more people. Um, I don't know what I would predict on that. I think it the 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 probably the most important age factor is going to be whether you were vaccinated against measles as a child or whether you got a natural measles infection as a child. And generally, people who've actually had measles start out with a higher antibody level than people who were vaccinated against measles. And so it takes longer after getting myeloma and being treated for myeloma for it to come down to zero. So that may actually prove to be a factor, but we'll see. We we just don't have information on that yet. Okay, I uh, thank you. That's very helpful. I appreciate it. Bye. Thanks. All right, thanks for your question. Okay, caller at 213-1668. Go ahead with your question. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Recently, my husband was in the hospital for five weeks, extremely ill, and received the treatment of IVIG, which is antibodies from 100 healthy people. Would that exclude him from your trial? Uh, it would not exclude him from the trial, but it would um, delay participation in the trial because IVIG contains anti-measles antibody. And after receiving IVIG, it takes quite a long time before that's um, eliminated from the body. And so, um, you know, the likelihood is if you've had IVIG within the last month or two, then there is going to be a significant amount of anti anti-measles antibody in the blood. So it okay. would influence the, um, influence the, the uh, eligibility uh, on the basis of how long since the IVIG. Great. Okay, well, thank you for all your work. Thank you. Okay, we'll go back to caller um, 812-0546. If you'd like to ask your question, go ahead. Okay, and maybe we'll just go to a couple more questions that we had. We had one from Doug who says, if the virus is effective for a certain period of time, would you give it as a repeat therapy and or even as at a lower dose as a preventive therapy for reoccurrence? Um, I don't think it would be valuable at a lower dose as preventive therapy. Would we give it as a repeat therapy problematic because all of the patients who we've given the virus to have subsequently developed high levels of anti-measles antibody. Mm. So, you know, I think it has to be seen as a single cycle therapy unless and until we uh, develop this cell carrier approach, in which case we would be able to give it repeatedly. Okay, that's very informative. And one last question from Karen. She said, I saw that this therapy had some impact on CD46. So are these viruses just attacking specific proteins, kind of like some immunotherapies do with CD38 or CD138? Uh, no. Uh, it's, it's more complex than that. The virus, um, in order to get inside the myeloma cell, first attaches to the surface of the myeloma cell and then subsequently injects its material in there. The receptor to which it attaches is CD46. Hmm. And CD46 is expressed at very high levels on multiple myeloma cells. And that's one of the reasons the virus has become specific um, for multiple myeloma. Okay, that makes sense. Well, Dr. Russell, we've kept you over 
but we are so very grateful for what you're doing. What This is remarkable and really game-changing work that you're doing. So we hope that you continue. We're very excited to see what your phase two clinical trial holds. I know there will be many patients interested in that, and we hope that this virus can be engineered in greater quantities so a lot more patients can take advantage of what you are learning. Well, thank you, Jenny, for everything that you do. I think this is a, a you know it's a wonderful resource you're providing here with this radio station, and um, and I think it's been very helpful to you know spend an hour with you clarifying an awful lot of things because it's so easy for these for the story to become distorted if you don't have time to discuss things. So I really do very much appreciate the opportunity. So thank you. Well, we're so very grateful for all that you're doing, so please keep going. (laughs) Will do. Yes. All right. Thank you so very much. Goodbye. (laughs) Thank you for listening to another episode of Innovation in Myeloma. Join us next week for our next inpatient radio interview as we learn more about how we as patients can help drive to a cure for myeloma by joining clinical trials. Ryan here and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus.